My daughter loved bedtime stories. Tucking her in, I'd read her three fairy tales a night before she'd finally fall asleep. Her favorites were Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, but there was one I'd always skip. When she'd ask me why I wouldn't read her Red Riding Hood, I said, I can't. It gives me nightmares. Maybe someday when you're older. I'd kiss her goodnight, lock the windows, check the doors, and smoke alone on the porch at midnight, knowing there's worse than wolves in this world. Vallejo, California. I'm 21 years old. My girlfriend's 23, and we move with our newborn daughter into the only apartment complex welfare can afford. The rent is cheap because we're the first room next to the only door of a three-story complex and the doorbell is broken. So every hour, people are pounding on the front door, waking up my daughter from the crib and sending us screaming into the hall, next time, call first. The complex is next to a bus stop and a porn store. We sleep with a baseball bat beside our bed and the only thing that separates us from the street is that door and our deadbolt. All I want is to shut out the world, to ignore the slurred screams from the second story, the passed out people on the sidewalk. But I can't ignore the girl in the hallway. It's hard to. I see her every day. She has a got to smile, messy brown hair and a doll that dangles from its only arm. Every day she asks me, what's your baby's name? I say it's Nadia, remember? She always wants to come inside, but I don't know which door she belongs to. Don't want parents to watch her going into a stranger's home. So I say, maybe another time, okay, honey? Why don't you go run along now? Go play. Every day I see her, coloring books on the staircase, just another part of the complex, like the white guy on the porch with bad tattoos who asks me for a cigarette every time I take out the trash. Every morning, what's your baby's name? I answer, and she never remembers till it becomes just another noise like the gunshots a block away or the sirens that become my daughter's first lullabies. One day the girl is crying, so she's hungry. So we finally invite her inside and I give her cookies and milk like a stray cat. She wants to stay, but it's our daughter's bedtime. You gotta go to your own home now, okay, honey? I'll see you tomorrow. She waved goodbye to my daughter, then I locked the door behind her and left her in the hallway. The next day, she disappears. It's December 9th, 1999. By midnight, cops are knocking. Two days later, FBI agents are pounding on the front door. News van spotlights blast through the blind. Now the missing girl has become an official case. When I see her face on the 10 o'clock news, it's the first time I realize I never knew her name. Ziana Fairchild. She's seven years old. Born in prison to a mother in for auto theft. They sent her to her great aunt Hawaii to grow up swimming in warm waters until her mother demanded her back. Ziana's only lived in our complex for six months. The rumor is her mother's been running meth missions down to Mexico and leaves Ziana for days alone on the staircase. The neighbors two doors down have been feeding her, even called child protective services, but nothing changed. The rest of us did nothing and locked our doors to a girl we saw every day. Now our great aunt flies back from Hawaii with an army of reporters, national news, candlelight vigils, thousands of posters in every street corner. Hundreds of thousands volunteer to march through forests and marshes looking for an answer no one wants to find at their feet. Ziana's mother and her boyfriend are too strung out for the spotlight. I overhear him slur about having to make another appearance at the volunteer center in the morning as the police monitor their every move, building their case. Bobby, the boyfriend, was the last person to see Ziana. He's a guy that asks me for cigarettes every time I take out the trash. His story of that morning changes every day. First, he dropped her off at school, then he took her to the bus stop, then maybe she walked alone. They give him a polygraph test and he fails, and his prison record hits the front page. He's an ex-con, just released for holding down his ex-girlfriend's infant son under scalding hot water until his flesh burned to bone. His past now exposed, Bobby stopped showing his face. 
The neighbor above me with a tattooed tear says, if Ziana doesn't come home, Bobby's gonna go missing himself one day. Bobby and the mother avoid the press as canines sniff our staircase and lab technicians spray our dumpster for blood stains. The word is they don't have enough evidence to charge Bobby as the weeks turn into months and the reward grows to 75 grand. Bobby and the mother know the world is watching, so they try to move out at midnight. But cameras come out of the shadows, neighbors screaming at Ziana's mother for sticking with this monster. She shoves reporters out of the way, and then there's a moment outside by the car where I'm alone with Bobby. He asks me for a cigarette. I say, no fucking way. I want to smash his face in to hurt him the way he hurts children. But then the cameras come back, and I know I miss my moment. They drive away past a poster of a gap-toothed girl grinning on the street corner. It's been eight months, and Ziana still hasn't come home. Every new parent knows you're paranoid enough of thumbtacks on the carpet and every sharp edge to a table. But now I'm awake until sunrise against my daughter's crib, afraid she's going to miss a single breath. A month later, another girl goes missing, only blocks away. She's eight years old, kidnapped for three days, handcuffed to a stick shift in a parking lot as her abductor is inside a Home Depot, shopping for a body bag to fit her height. She escapes a car full of Polaroids and duct tape, flags down a trucker on the freeway, and finally, the wolf of Vallejo bears his face. It wasn't Bobby. I was wrong. We were all wrong. It was worse. His name is Curtis Dean Anderson, a taxi driver and a family friend of Ziana, a man, a man who I'd opened the apartment complex door for many times before. He was a monster, a deadbolt didn't stop. Just another cab driving down the same street my daughter took her first steps on. A man who watched Ziana walk alone to school every morning as her neighbors locked our doors on a girl we saw every day. A year after she went missing, they found Ziana's skull in the Santa Cruz Mountains, identified only by her grinning gap teeth. Curtis pled guilty to avoid the death penalty, claimed to have killed a dozen more girls, but their bodies were never found. He bragged to his cellmate about what he had done to Ziana, details I would never repeat. He died of natural causes in prison the same year my daughter reached Ziana's age. Ziana was across every headline, but now she's yellowing newsprint, empty volunteer centers, a testament to locked doors. She was a story I could never tell my daughter. Why Red Riding Hood gave me nightmares. Some girls never make it out of the forest. Some stories children should never hear. It's been 15 years, and I wish I had someone to apologize to. I don't know if I could have saved you, but I could have done something. Could have invited you in instead of shutting you out with the deadbolt. I'm sorry. I can't drive past our old apartment complex without thinking of you trying to open our door with seven-year-old arms. I didn't know your story when you were alive, but I can tell it now and ask the world to remember your name. Ziana Fairchild, the girl I left in the hallway. I don't want to ask for a moment of silence, but I want to ask a moment of noise for her. Make noise so she can hear you, please. <laughs> 